you're monitoring a volcano and your geochemist reports that 5,000 tons per day of sulfur dioxide is being emitted. Is that a lot? If the ratio of water to CO2 is 100 compared with yesterday when it was 10, what does that mean? Is it important if you just started to detect, to detect HCl or bromine oxide? Well, in this short lecture, we're going to delve into some of the key chemical and petrological principles helpful to understand volatile solubilities in magmas. And even though all volatiles need to follow similar rules, it turns out that they all have somewhat different behaviors. Ideally, the material in this lecture will increase your knowledge about volatiles in magmas and provide some increased insight that will be helpful as you move into more complex subjects. You can pause the slides and go back and review things if I move too quickly. First, let's introduce the relevant terms that we're going to use. By volatiles, we're referring to those gases or metals that tend to partition out of the melt and into any vapor phase that might be present. By melt, we're referring here to silicate melt, since we are ultimately focused on rock melt that come out of volcanoes, and silicate melts dominate at nearly all volcanoes. By solubility, we're referring about the concentration of a gas in the melt at the point of saturation with a specific phase of fixed composition. For example, things are simple for water, where we're referring to the concentration of H2O in a silicate melt saturated with pure water or steam. But as we'll learn, things do get more complicated. Well, the first thing we want to do is address the concept of phases. Magmas can have many phases present. The vapor phase is one, the silicate melt is one, and the various different crystal types like olivine or magnetite or plagioclase, different kinds of phenocrysts, they all count as separate phases. Phases are made of components like individual gases or end-member minerals. For example, olivine is a solid solution with components of forstrite and phaolite. The gas or vapor phase is also multi-component and can be a mixture of multiple gas species. Sometimes I may call it a fluid phase, but I'm still referring to the gas, or vapor, or volatile phase when I do so. Now a multi-component vapor will likely have components like water, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and other trace gases. Each of these gases will have a partial pressure, all of which sum up to the total pressure in the system. So the sum of the partial pressures for each gas, P sub I, will sum up to the total pressure. As in the bottom equation, for an ideal gas, the partial pressure will be exactly equal to its mole fraction in the vapor phase. As discussed earlier, the solubility of a volatile is the concentration of that component at the point of saturation with the phase of fixed composition for that component. So in the left diagram, the concentration of the volatile in the melt increases until it reaches saturation at 100% of that volatile in the vapor phase. Its concentration in the melt at that time is X, the solubility limit. Now let's take water on the right. At 100 MPa, megapascals equivalent to 3.5 kilometers depth in the Earth, you can dissolve about 4 weight percent water in a rhyolitic melt at 800 degrees C. If there's any more than that, you'll form bubbles of pure water or steam. So in this example, 4% is the solubility of water. Now we need to specify the temperature, the pressure, and the melt composition because the solubility can vary with all of those factors. If there weren't any other volatiles present, when you have less than 4 weight percent water, you would be in a volatile, undersaturated system. There would be no bubbles. But if there was other volatiles present, like carbon dioxide, then there could be a vapor phase around, and the concentration of water would be somewhere along that red line, with water less than 4%. Ideally, if there were 50% other gases, as where this yellow circle is, then the dissolved water concentration would be about 2% or half of its concentration compared with the saturation with pure water. Now this is all simplified here. In real magmas, the addition of another volatile can sometimes somewhat increase the vol solubility of other volatiles due to chemical interactions. At the same temperature and pressure, the solubility of carbon dioxide is around 800 ppm, or about 50 times less than that of water. One really important thing, though, is that you can't dissolve both gases up to their full solubility limits at the same time. 
That is, you can't be both water saturated and CO2 saturated at the same time. And that's because the gases won't form separate phases, but instead they mix and they form a multi-component phase, the magmatic vapor phase. The black line in the plot on the right is a range of dissolved water and CO2 concentrations in the melt, in this case at 100 megapascals and 800 degrees C. Everything along that line is a mixed volatile phase that contains both gases uh, with their dissolved concentrations less than that for the end members. Here's a plot with different isobars for different pressures and is valid for a fixed melt composition. You can make these plots and the ones you're about to see by using a program called Volatile Calc, which is now around 20 years old, but is still useful for gaining understanding and general intuition. Here's a plot that adds in these red lines, isopleths, for different gas compositions that would be in equilibrium with the melt at varying pressures. 100% water vapor would fall along the x-axis, 100% CO2 vapor would fall along the y-axis. The star in this diagram re represents a melt composition that would be saturated with vapor at any pressure less than about 350 MPa. The vapor phase would contain about 50% water and 50% CO2. If we add water-rich vapor to the system at a constant pressure, or we simply crystallize the magma, the melt composition and coexisting vapor will migrate parallel to the isobars and become more water-rich. If we drop the pressure on the system, the magma will degas, losing CO2 far faster than water due to its much lower solubility. This trend represents open system degassing, where the vapor immediately escapes. The leftmost degassing path is instead a closed system path where CO2 rich vapor is allowed to stay in equilibrium with the water rich melt as the magma rises and the pressure is continuously reduced. The trend of the path will become shallower if an accumulation of CO2 rich vapor is present in a closed system. If the magma stalls out at 230 MPa, the melt will have about 5.8% dissolved, dissolved water and a vapor phase with 80% water. And if we add a CO2 rich gas, the melt composition will migrate along the 220 MPa isobar along the black arrow. This could happen if CO2 rich gas bubbles were added to the magma from below. So now we've talked about water and carbon dioxide, two of the most abundant and relatively straightforward volatiles, at least in the upper five kilometers or so. Now let's talk about other volatiles. The simplest ones are the noble gases and diatomic molecules like nitrogen, that don't react significantly with the melt, at least at low pressure. And then instead they dissolve within holes in the silicate melt structure. In the diagram on the left, you can see that argon is more soluble in rhyolitic melt, the diamonds, than in basaltic melt, the squares. By comparing plots we looked at in earlier slides, you can also see that for rhyolite, the solubility of argon and CO2 are comparable. In contrast, CO2 is generally more soluble in basalts than argon. The diagram on the right depicts the partition coefficients for different noble gases. The partition coefficient, or K, is proportional to the concentration of an element, X sub I, in the vapor or fluid compared to its concentration in the melt, the two variables at the far side of the equation on the bottom, and accounting for complexities like fugacity coefficients and activity coefficients. K is really no different than a Henry Law constant for nickel going into olivine. Anyway, the plot shows higher solubility of noble gases in rhyolite compared with a basalt, as well as the greater solubility of the light noble gases, for example, helium in magma compared with heavy ones like krypton and xenon. These partition coefficients imply very low concentrations of noble gases in real magmas. For example, if the vapor phase had one mole percent helium, which is a lot, it would imply around one part per million helium dissolved in the melt based on the partition coefficients shown in the plot on the right. When you start to add sulfur into the mix, things get a little bit more complicated, but we're still following the same basic rules. Sulfur gases will eagerly join the vapor phase as long as other volatiles like water and CO2 are present. And if sulfur gases are only a minor part of the vapor phase, the concentration of sulfur dissolved in the melt is going to be far less than it would be at some hypothetical saturation with a pure sulfur gas phase.
But sulfur is tricky because sulfur saturation in magma is pretty much never due to saturation with a gas like SO2 or pure sulfur liquid. In most magmas, the solubility of sulfur is limited by saturation with either liquid or crystalline sulfide. Little blebs of pyrotite or some variety of iron copper sulfide. Some examples are on the left. The sulfides may not always remain stable in the magma as conditions change so that they can become a source of sulfur degassing when or if the sulfides break down as shown in some of the rightmost images on the left panel. Moreover, rhyolites are often saturated with molybdenite, now shown on the left, which is a phase with fixed composition like pure water or CO2. Since the activity of sulfur in molybdenite is fixed, the presence of that phase implies a fixed composition or concentration of sulfur in the melt as long as there's enough molybdenum. In oxidized magma, the situation is different and sulfides are often absent. Sulfur dissolves as sulfate, and ultimately the magma saturates with calcium sulfate or anhydrite as shown in the Pinatubo magma on the right, where the anhydrite is labeled as AN. In the plot on the left, we can see that in pyrotate saturated basalts, the solubility of sulfur is a function of iron oxide concentration in the melt, and that's because ferrous iron tends to bond with sulfur within the melt, and of course, it's the primary sink or partner for sulfur in the exolving sulfide phase. Lots of people have studied the behavior of sulfur in magma and have demonstrated profound effects of temperature, pressure, oxidation state, sulfidation state, and melt composition on the concentration of sulfur in sulfide and sulfate saturated magmas. The huge range in behavior of sulfur can be illustrated in this plot on the right from Pedro Ugo and colleagues who document how the ratio of sulfate to total sulfur is greatly dependent on oxygen fugacity. Despite these complexities, software programs still often parameterize this partitioning of sulfur between the melt and a coexisting vapor phase, sort of like it was a noble gas with a fixed K, as we discussed earlier. Solex is a program that parameterizes sulfur based on this plot of K versus pressure. The plot on the left is really specific just to a temperature of 1150 degrees C, an oxidation state of about 1.5 to 2 log units above nickel-nickel oxide, and an equilibrium with a specific melt composition as studied by Lesney et al. 2011. So suffice it to say, the parameterization can be considered highly approximate for other composition temperatures and oxygen fugacities. So be careful when you're using software that calculates vapor melt partitioning for sulfur. You'll need to assess whether it's appropriate for the conditions of the magma you are modeling. This illustrates just how much experimental and theoretical work needs to be done for us to adequately model the behavior of sulfur in magmas. Another important and useful thing that you can glean from the plot on the left is that typically, especially at the relevant oxidizing conditions, there will be hundreds to thousands of times higher concentrations of sulfur in the vapor compared with the melt. You can also see that the circles at the bottom of the plot indicate K values for chlorine, a substance that is far more compatible in the melt phase compared with sulfur. Chlorine is yet again different, and it's not really any simpler. You didn't think this would be easy to do. The plot on the left shows a phase diagram for the H2O NaCl system. There's no silicate melt present, and the bluish field is where there is an immiscibility gap. For example, when you sit at 100 MPa at 700 degrees C and you have more than about 2% NaCl, you will saturate the vapor with a very saline brine phase. In other words, at those conditions, it's impossible to have a fluid with, for example, 10% NaCl, the yellow circle labeled A. Instead, you'll have a chlorine-poor vapor phase and a chlorine-rich brine phase, whose composition are shown as the red dots. The yellow dots from the original source of the figure, Audita and Edmonds, shows the unmixing of a high-pressure fluid, the top yellow dot, to the lower yellow dots along the 500 degree isotherm at around 50 MPa. The field of emissibility grows even bigger when you add CO2 to the system, so don't think you can simplify things by adding a bit of carbon. It turns out emissibility has important implications for the solubility of chlorine and silicate melt. 
because the vapor and brine don't get to ignore the rules just because silicate melt is present. Hiroshi Shinohara made this point back in 1989 and reinforced it in his 2009 paper, a plot from which is shown on the right. In the plot, liquid is the term used for brine, which can also be called hydrosaline melt. Here you have a diagram of chlorine concentration in the fluid versus chlorine concentration in the melt. The different fields of vapor, vapor plus liquid, liquid, and liquid plus halite are shown at the top. In real systems, we don't usually get halite saturation except perhaps in unusual situations like where magma intrudes evaporites. Now let's look more closely at the figure on the right. On its left side, you have melt equilibrating with a vapor, and you can model the system with a Henry's Law constant, or D, for the vapor melt system. Yay, easy. But once you saturate the vapor with a liquid or brine, the two volatile phases are of fixed invariable composition. If you add more chlorine, you just create more brine. The activity of chlorine is therefore fixed, and it doesn't matter how much chlorine you add. The chlorine concentration in the melt can't change either. It stays along the same horizontal line in the plot until you dry out the system and vapor is no longer present, in which case you can get Henry in behavior again and you can force more chlorine into the melt. Pretty cool, huh? Oh, and the maximum solubility for chlorine is when you have an anhydrous magma saturated with either solid or molten halite. Halite melts at around 800 degrees C. The next key observation is that chlorine is much more soluble in basalt than in rhyolite. That's obvious in the plot on the left. Jim Webster did a lot of work on this topic and found that the ratio of total aluminum, magnesium, calcium, and sodium over silica tracks chlorine solubility in the melt. In the plot on the right, he used his modeling to show that the rhyolites at Augustine Volcano eventually saturate with vapor plus brine, labeled hydrosaline melt in the plot, a phenomenon inferred by others in papers throughout the years. One last point to consider is that the equation below moves to the right as pressure is dropped. That means that HCl is increasingly volatilized at low pressure and the vapor leaving the magma becomes increasingly acidic upon cooling. Other halogens are also increasingly volatilized at low pressure. For example, hydrogen bromide can degas and is rapidly oxidized in the atmosphere because BRO is easily detected with UV spectroscopy in volcanic plumes, it provides a clear indicator that magma is near the surface in act actively losing its halogens. Well, I started this talk by mentioning geochemical monitoring and the significance of different gas ratios and concentrations. We just talked about chlorine and bromine. Let's finish up by mentioning the other two topics. 5,000 tons per day of sulfur corresponds to the amount of SO2 that can be released from about 1.7 million cubic meters of andesite with 500 parts per million sulfur dissolved in the melt, a considerable but reasonable amount of sulfur. Of course, to get all the sulfur out requires presumably fairly shallow magma circulation, so you could also be partially degassing a greater amount of magma on a daily basis. The only other pieces of information you need to reproduce my calculation is the density of magma, which I assume to be 2.9 tons per cubic meter, and the molecular weights of sulfur and SO2. As for a H2O to CO2 ratio of 100, that implies either that you have very low CO2 in your magma, or the magma is shallow and therefore losing abundant water, which won't be released normally until the magma is within 1 to 2 kilometers of the surface. Well, that's all for today. I hope these simple lessons have proved useful to your understanding of magmatic volatiles. If you want more information, here are some good articles to look at. Here are all the references mentioned in this presentation. Wait a second and they'll scroll up for you. And don't forget to wait for the melt inclusion. Okay, let's cross nickels and put this thing to rest. Thanks so much for your attention.